Good day. Welcome to our worship our, for the 17th of January, uh, the second Sunday after Epiphany. We welcome you all at any time that you join us in our worship here at Strathairn United Church. And um, bring your attention to various notices. Um, uh, th this week we'll be having our board meeting to discuss a variety of issues. Um, one in terms, of course, the, the reduction in restrictions, see if they have any impact on our, um, the, what we offer as a church, and um, various other kind of the, the, the usual day-to-day um, -day realities of life of the church, even in times of COVID-19. Bills are paid, decisions are made, and the ongoing life of our ministry, you have outreach, of property, and uh, links with the larger church. So uh, the wheels of service continue to turn for the church. Uh, as you will notice in the bulletin, we uh, have some sad news that uh, Jerry Rodunsky passed away this week. Uh, he had um, been struggling with cancer for the last few weeks, and uh, there will be a memorial service that at this point, uh, we believe will be held at uh, will be held at Park Memorial. Uh, obviously, they'll be under the restrictions of the COVID-19 restrictions. But the plan is for the service to be live streamed at 3:30 next Saturday. And once, obviously, once we have more information, we will share that information with the congregation for those who wish to attend virtually the service. Uh, I'll be presiding over it. Let's just take a moment and let us light the Christ candle in memory of Jerry Rudinsky, a faithful servant of this congregation. thanks for the light of faith that was Jerry Rodinsky amongst us. We give thanks that he was a servant of the good news of the kingdom of God. We hold in our thoughts and prayers the family and friends and all who grieved the passing of Jerry. And we give thanks that his witness was part of our congregation. Amen. Let us continue in our worship. Listen, God is calling Pray, God is calling. Sing, God is calling. Be present, God is calling. Listen. Let us continue with Teach Me God to Wonder, Voices United 299. That's 299.
Let us join together in a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. In prayer, we gather before God and open our hearts to the wonder of grace. God, we confess that sometimes we struggle to hear your voice, and sometimes we confuse other voices for yours. And sometimes we fear where you may call us to follow you. God, we pray that you will respond to our struggles so we may whisper, here I am, Lord. God, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. God, have mercy. In silence, we hear the voice of God who knows our struggles and with grace touches our hearts. So once more, we will be the presence of God in the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. We shall now sing, Spirit of the Living God.
Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. <coughs> a reading from the first book of Samuel. And the lad Samuel was ministering to the Lord in Eli's presence. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Vision was not spread about. And it happened on that day that Eli was lying in his place. His eyes had begun to grow bleary. He could not see. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying in the temple of the Lord in which was the ark of God. And the Lord called to Samuel and said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I did not call. Go back, lie down. And Samuel went and lay down. And the Lord called once again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I did not call my son. Go back, lie down. And Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called still again to Samuel a third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli understood that the Lord was calling the lad. And Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And should someone call to you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood poised and called, on, called as on each time before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
Just this week, um, with the kind of the, the ongoing fallout from the events in the United States, beginning with the attempt at insurrection, there's been a fairly common theme in some of the you know the places I lurk, and one of the questions that people are asking is, how can you be a Christian in a world when people think of Christians of the ilk of Franklin Graham? Franklin Graham just this week compared members of the Republican Party who actually had the morality and integrity to vote for the impeachment of President Trump. And thankfully, we won't be seeing that for much longer. He compared these Republican con members of Congress to Judas. He said of people who understood their duty to protect the state from insurrection that they had taken 30 pieces of silver and betrayed Christ. He was comparing Donald Trump with Christ. Think about that. How can you be a Christian when the world views Christians in the light of Franklin Graham and his ilk? How are we supposed to talk about being faithful to a call of God when the people in the street would look at us and say, oh, you're the kind of folks that think that Trump was betrayed or whatever. And that's true in Canada as well. You know, despite the fact that the United Church of Canada is the largest Protestant denomination, people don't think of us when they think of Christians. And that's part of the problem is because we live next door to the States. The challenge that we face is how to be faithful witnesses to good news that should be blindly obvious has got nothing to do with the likes of Franklin Graham and his ilk. But the reality is we're part of a long story and Samuel in very many ways is part of that story. The life and ministry of Samuel is a story of a man called by God to tell the people uncomfortable truths and they ignore him. 
Instead, they listen to the likes of Franklin Graham of their time and tell themselves they want things like kings. They want things like temples. And they want the right to have power and dominion over others. The scandal of Christianity in North America, and it's North America, by the way, it's not just the United States, it's also Canada as well. There are many Christians in this land who want to have power and dominion over others, who want to strip the rights away from other people. We look at members of the LGBTQ community, for example, and decide they don't have the right to have the things that everyone else has. Who want to have the right to control women's lives. We follow a call from God to be faithful to God's story. And we struggle to have our voices heard. They are being heard. One of the most dreadful and illustrations of that is that um, I follow the United Church of Christ on Facebook and Twitter. Yesterday, they posted a warning to their churches to warn them that they were potentially under threat from attacks from white nationalists in the United States. Because the United Church of Christ is seen as an enemy to their Christian view. It's seen as an enemy because it promotes inclusiveness. You know, the stuff that Jesus actually talks about. You know, Jesus doesn't say, get lost, leper, leper. get lost, prostitute, get lost, tax player. Jesus invites them in. And yet they have been told they're going to be attacked because they're not Christian enough. That's, yeah, you know, one of my hobby horses on the internet, and I have so many hobby horses, I have a whole stable of them, is pointing at real cases of Christian persecution. Christian persecution that exists. For example, Christians who go to the border in the United States and help those who are trying to cross the border and give them water and give them food and then get arrested. You don't heal a Franklin Graham and his ilk crying out on their behalf. Christians who offer messages of inclusiveness, who support Black Lives Matter and get vandalized. And I haven't heard much support from Franklin Graham for the fact that main, mainland churches in the United States are now facing terrorist attacks. What does this, what does this mean? Like, I'm sure you're asking yourself, what's he going on about now? Like, well, as we heard in the solo from Catherine, we're part of a vision that is as Throughout, goes throughout the whole of scripture which is the world is going to change and everything that we think is important everything that we think is meaningful will be shown in the light of God as absolute meaningless worthless the rule of kings and their ilk will pass and the day of the Lord will come But it's a struggle. And it's an ancient struggle. What we hear in the reading from the book of Samuel is that the people of Israel live in a time when the visions are rare. I think it's more a sense of people are not listening. God is always speaking. God is always calling out to us. It's just that there are days and there are times in our lives and the lives of humanity that we just say, ah, I can't be bothered. Life's too complicated. Life's too grim. I'm just trying to get by God. Please don't have expectations of me. Samuel lives in such days. I like that vision. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And yet, it is still being spoken. Now Samuel, well, 
he's quite the grim picture of prophecy. Uh, I have this conceit of prophets speaking with Scottish accents. Grim, dour, and no one listens to you. And you're always right. You know, it's a conceit, right? But Samuel in particular, I can't think of anyone else who should be played by some great Scottish actor. Um, Peter Capaldi. He'd play great Samuel. I mean, he'd probably swear a lot too, and he'd probably in Hebrew or Aramaic, so you couldn't understand what he was saying. Samuel will be the voice of God who will tell the people, do not pick kings. They will destroy your vision of a community of God. Don't do it. And, you know, he knows what he's talking about. He gives them a long list of stuff that the kings will do. Of course, they go ahead and do it. You know, no one listens and he's right. And he has the... He does have the dubious pleasure, which I enjoy myself, I confess, because I'm a terrible person. I told you so. And he says it probably far more grim and whatever. In fact, at one point, he, you know, he actually anoints the king and this kind of stuff. And then it, he turns around and rejects the king. And you know, once more, that Scottishness comes in. I have this vision of Samuel turning around and saying to Saul, you're good for nothing and you'll come to nothing. That's what kings are. Good for nothing and they'll come to nothing. The history of Israel is clear with a very few minor exceptions and one major exception, I guess, with David and even then the jury is out. Kings were good for nothing and they come to nothing. Because that's not the story that God tells. The story that God tells us of a community with no more kings than their ilk, but a community that celebrates in the eyes of God, we are all equally worthy of love and all equally entitled to share in God's blessings. That's the point of the community of God and the community of creation. There is no hierarchy. No one gets to be first in line First in line at the table, first in line for whatever we have created hierarchies of power for. No one gets special privileges, no one gets entitlements from birth or money or whatever. You are beloved of God and invited by God to share that hope with others. You're invited by God to be part of a story where the world will be renewed through our willingness to talk and listen to one another and respect one another as equals in the eyes of God. There is no kings, presidents, prime ministers, premiers. There are people, women and men, doing their best to try and live a good life in the midst of difficult days. Days that we make difficult because we keep on wanting kings and presidents and their ilk. So how do we endure? Well, like Samuel, we know we're part of a story of faith that stretches back to the days of Noah and Abraham, of ordinary people, ordinary people. God doesn't speak that much to kings. He certainly doesn't speak much to presidents and their ilk. And it's not very often that we hear him speaking to the actual religious clergy of the Bible. You know, Abraham didn't go to a seminary. You know, Samuel is one of the first that we hear of having some kind of priestly training. And to be, you know, to, to be honest, the training he's getting, the person who's doing it is not great at the job. So Samuel, Samuel knows that he's part of a story of ordinary people listening to the voice of God. And in doing so, their lives are changed and they become part of a larger story. 
To be called by God is to be reminded that we're partners with God in preparing the way for the fulfillment of God's hope in us. It is a sign that God has faith in us. And that call can be heard by anyone. God doesn't pick a chosen few to be the presence of God in the world. All who are all who are willing to invite God to be part of their lives can be part of the story. God doesn't want us to hoard these blessings, but to invite people to share in the vision of living its reality today. It may seem that there are days when we walk alone. We listen, as I said earlier, we live in a world where people think of Christians, they think of Franklin Graham and all that ilk. And the reality is, certain communities, Christian communities, do reflect that vision of Christian domination, dominion over others. And yet, there always have been the other Christians the meek ones, well, not meek, respectful. We're respectful in that we try to understand what it means to be a person in this world, and we, we offer our vision of faith in a way that we respect one another. We don't, well, we do tell people how to live, no, we don't tell, we invite people how to live better lives. And just because it comes from me with a Scottish accent, I might sound a bit more harsher than others. Ah, you got to do that. It'll be good for you. Yeah, I once saw. Um, <laughs> should, I once saw this guy kind of joke about what does it sound like when people swear, and it has a, an English person swearing it's a cat, and a, a Russian swearing it's a barking dog, and a German ordering breakfast, and it's this huge dragon. And I all wonder what it is like when a Scotsman says hello to you, like you know, the devil himself practically. Anyhow, back to the sermon. There has always been that way in the Christian story of people who have tried to approach others with respect, with compassion, and offering an invitation. We don't get as much airplay in the world because we're not dramatic. The way we invite people to share in our story doesn't get people's attention. Because in many ways we are in opposition to more traditional Christian ways of looking at things. As I recently said a couple of weeks ago on a sermon, the traditional Christian vision of light against dark, good against evil. One side has to be defeated so that we will remain victorious. You know, kind of the world of onward Christian soldiers, which we don't sing anymore, thankfully. Then, because that's, that doesn't work. You're not inviting people to be part of a story. You're imposing your faith upon others. And when you impose something on others, there'll be a day when they'll say, I'm done with this. This is not working. This seems wrong to me. But if you invite people to be part of the story, there's a better chance they'll continue on the journey. Faith is a journey. It begins when we hear a call from God to be a witness to God's love in the world. It becomes an invitation to be part of a community of people from the past, present, and future who said to God with varying degrees of enthusiasm, okay, God, I'll be part of your story. So what happens next? It's a community that shares stories, stories of how our lives are changed, hopes of how we can change the lives of others through service and connection. How does it begin? It begins when we listen to the voice of God in the business of the world, the quietness of the night, and connect. 
and say to God, here I am. What happens now? Amen. So many papers here. In this time of our offering, we remember all the, the cloud of witnesses are part of the life, the life of the church, uh, the, the, the worship team, property, mission and outreach, finance, uh, administration, connections with the larger church, the trustees, the whole picture of who we are. And we give thanks for the faithful witness of our congregation that even in these trying times shows our commitment to be part of the ongoing story of God through their service to this congregation. So in a moment of silence, let us give thanks for the continuing service of this church. To clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. From Cal Bart, and one of the things, this explains a lot about me and my preaching and whatever, uh, but Cal Bart is one of my great influences and one of the things that stuck with me, <laughs> much to many people's consternation, is that when it came to the question of politics and preaching, Karl Barth was very clear. He said that the, the minister is called to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper on the other. That Karl Barth was very clear. This idea that you could divorce our relationship with the world and the politics that's going on around us, it, it doesn't work. We're not called to impose our belief systems on others. That's definitely not what we're called to do. What we are called to do is to invite people to explore different ways of being in relationship with one another, especially when we live in a world when many people are suffering, many people are struggling, and people are trying to make sense of what's going on around them. The invitation that we have from God as we preach with the Bible in one hand in these days the TV, the news website, or whatever, is to offer insights, offer visions, offer dreams of new ways of living, of new ways of community. So let us come before God in prayer. God, we gather before you to give thanks in these difficult days. We give thanks for all who are your light, who do what they can to bring compassion, hope, and justice into the lives of others, who are willing to reach out and ask, what can we do for you? In silence, God, we bring to you the names of those who have been your light to us. God, we bring our prayers to you. Our prayers for a better world. Our prayers that we will have the strength, courage, and compassion to embrace and enact your vision of how this will be a better world. We pray for a world ravaged by COVID-19 in the ways that has changed so much of what was once familiar. We pray for all who are part of the healthcare infrastructure, medical frontline staff, service staff, 
serv civil servants within the, within the infrastructure. We give thanks for what they have done and we pray as we hear more and more stories of their struggles, their frustrations, their fears, their worries that we as a community, as a, as a society are not doing what we can to make it easier for them to fight COVID-19. We pray for all who struggle in these times of economic, political, and social turmoil. For those fearful of their futures. For those who yearn for a world that will not return. And fearful of what happens to their futures. We pray for all who face oppression and yearn for justice, who yearn for the basic right of being treated like everyone else. And we pray for the United States, a nation in turmoil, a nation facing profound questions of its future as it continues to struggle with the legacy of its past. We pray for Christian witness in the United States, fearful and yet hopeful. We, God, we pray for your church universal, that we may be a light to those who struggle, a light that will come from our own awareness of our own faults, of the legacy of our past, of when we fail to be your light in the world, O oh God, we pray that we will learn from that, those mistakes of true wisdom of what it means to be your light. And God, we come to you with the prayers of our hearts. For those who grieve, and this week we hold in our prayers and our hearts, the family and friends and all who mourn Jerry Rudunsky. Be with them in this time of sorrow. Bring healing and comfort. And God, we bring to you those who struggle with illness of the mind, body, and spirit. For those who are alone. For those who yearn for connection. In silence, we bring these names to you. Our closing hymn is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky, Voices United 509. That's 509.
by the Lord of snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love Let us make our way together, God. Wherever you go, we will go. And through whatever you pass, there too we will pass.